I'm Megan Katu. I'm an assistant professor at Boise State University in a group called Human Environment Systems. Um, I wanted to thank Andrew first for organizing this workshop, sort of herding all the cats together and just conceptualizing the idea. Um, it's been really nice to see a full range of perspectives about the use of NEON AOP for SES research, ranging from some kind of joyous enthusiasm all the way to deep and vehement skepticism. And so mm -hmm. I think both of those perspectives and everything in between is, is really useful. So I hope this conversation continues. Um, my presentation will be a little different because Andrew asked me to present on a specific project that I've been working on related to scaling NEON AOP data across space and time. Um, so I'm a landscape ecologist and a disturbance ecologist who uses remote sensing and spatial modeling to look at natural disturbances, and that's primarily wildfire. So I'll be presenting um, this work from that perspective today. Um, you're going to hear a lot about fire. I hope that is OK with you. Um, and I'm not going to deep dive into the methods of how I'm doing the scaling, but rather give you some larger framing and a general overview of the methods. But I'm happy to talk with anyone individually who does want to do a, a deeper dive into the methods. So we know that the role of fire on Earth is changing. Um, although fire disturbance has been present for millennia, um, fire regime characteristics are changing worldwide, um, mostly in tandem with land use land cover change and with climate change. Fire has been increasing specifically in size and in frequency in many parts of the world um, since the mid-1900s, and even more so toward the end of the century and in recent times. And these changes, um, you know, they of course have implications for ecosystems and for human health. We know that fire is changing in the United States. Um, previous work is showing anthropogenic ignitions or, or human-caused fires um, dominate many areas of the US. So you can see areas that are mostly red are primarily dominated by human ignitions. Areas that are mostly blue are primarily dominated by lightning ignitions. So we see much of the eastern US and some coastal western areas are almost completely dominated by human ignitions at this point. So we know that human-caused fires uh, expand fires to areas with higher fuel moisture and higher NPP relative to lightning-caused fires. So these are human-caused fires on the right lightning caused on the left with fuel moisture on the Y and NPP on the X here. And we can see that human caused fires occupy um, not only more niche space in that area, but also areas that have higher NPP, higher fuel moisture. Human caused fires also extend the wildfire season. So again, human caused fires here in red, lightning caused in blue, and we can see that human ignitions are expanding our fire shoulder seasons. Um, can anyone guess what this, this is? Yeah. Yeah, it's the 4th of July. Um, so fire is fundamentally, it's a biophysical process, but it's affected by, by human behavior, and sometimes that human behavior uh, is fireworks. Um, so at a national scale, fires are becoming larger, they're becoming more frequent over a longer fire season length, and human ignitions are increasing proportionally. There's about a 9% proportional increase from 92 to 2015 in, um, in human ignitions relative to lightning ignitions. Um, in terms of fire size increases, this is true for our mean and our maximum fires, meaning that our average fires are getting bigger. Also, our most extreme fires in terms of size are getting bigger at a national scale. And we find some threshold behaviors in response to human ignitions. So the proportion of human ignitions um, has a positive relationship with fire frequency after a threshold. And in this case, it's after at, greater, um, at or greater than about 70% human ignitions. We see increases in fire frequency there. We may also see more wildfire extremes. In this study led by Maxwell Joseph, um, we predicted wildfire, wild, wildfire extremes across the United States using the wildfire record um, with data on housing density and meteorological data. And we did this in spatial temporal Bayesian statistical models with spatially varying nonlinear effects. And the general approach was to generate a posterior um, predictive distribution based on finite sample maxima for extreme events over bounded spatial temporal domains. So basically what that means is we predicted, we predicted the largest fire per month per ecoregion. Not surprisingly, dryness and air temperature 
predict extreme wildfire probabilities, and housing density has a hump shape relationship with wildfire occurrence. So we're seeing the highest probability of wildfire in those intermediate levels of housing density. Um, statistically, these drivers affect the, um, the extreme wildfire in two ways. One is that it's altering wildfire size distribution. So the actual distribution of wildfire size is shifting. The second component of this is because there are more, there's more frequent fire, that influences sampling from the tails of that wildfire size distribution. So those two things are happening together. Um, the upshot here is that there's a non-negligible chance of extreme wildfires larger than those we've seen over the past 30 years in the United States. I'm going to take us to the Western United States, where there's a lot of evidence that a climate is a major player in changing our fire regimes. We're going to pan in specifically to the Southern Rockies ecoregion. Um, the fires we see here are from the Monitoring Trends in Burn Severity, or MTBS database. That database is going to come up a little bit in this talk today. Um, for the Western United States, that includes any fire perimeters for fires that are at least 1,000 um, acres in size. So smaller fires are excluded from this. And it's fires that occurred from 1984 to 2017. Um, we've spoken a lot about fire, um, but fire <laughs> also interacts with other ecological perturbations or disturbances. So over the past 30 years, fires or forests in the western United States have experienced a variety of natural disturbances. And that includes larger and more frequent wildfires, of course, but also increasingly severe and prolonged drought events, widespread insect outbreaks, blowdown events, and human land use. And that's both historical legacies like logging, but also current intermixing along the wildland urban interface. And the many data products that exist that represent these disturbances indicate that they're not uniform in their distribution or their intensity across the landscape. So this potential patchwork of interactions opens up many regional scale questions related to how disturbance interactions affect tree mortality and recovery at large spatial scales. And we can think about this in the context of ecological stability or how multiple disturbances influence the probability of ecosystem transitions or state shifts. This is a classic ball and cup heuristic of ecosystem stability. Many of you have probably seen this already. Um, but the trough represents um, the stability domain, and the ball represents the system itself. So you can imagine two scenarios in which multiple disturbances affect these two ecosystems. And depending on the magnitude of the effect, in this very simplified schematic, we see either ecosystem resilience, whereby the system is perturbed, but it returns to its pre-disturbance state, or an ecosystem transition, or a state shift. Um, just a little sidebar here is that resilience has a lot of different definitions. We were talking about this at lunch today, or yesterday. Um, it's sort of a broad term, much like sustainability, that has become somewhat nebulous. So I think when you hear this word, always um, ask for clarification about what it means. <laughs> In the ecological community, people are often referring to two things. One could be engineering resilience, um, which is the time of return to a global equilibrium following a disturbance, or ecological resilience, with the amount of disturbance that a system can absorb before it changes state. Um, I'm going to use this word primarily to mean ecological resilience. Um, so you can also imagine this in the context of a single disturbance of increasing intensity. So not just multiple disturbances and their interactions, but how strong an individual disturbance is as well. So a single intense disturbance, there's a lot of um, evidence that can create regeneration pathways and mechanisms that are much less predictable than after a single disturbance that's within the historical range of variation in terms of its intensity. And so these novel successional pathways are possible in potential altered stable states. I also want to note that when we're talking about shifts between states, we could be referring to a variety of things. So for example, between land cover types, forest to grassland, between plant functional types, coniferous forest to deciduous forest, for example, um, even between vegetation characteristics from a sparse forest to a dense forest of equal size um, and height, for example, um, and even ecosystem services, um, just sufficient to insufficient resources as a very basic example. 
And we've seen some evidence of complex interactions among disturbances that affect recovery in either direction. So this is just one example of looking at forest regeneration eight years after wildfire. So this group found that areas that had um, really strong blowdown intensities were not recovering in the same way after wildfire as areas that had lower blowdown intensities. Not super surprising, but the part where I think it gets really interesting is that some areas experienced salvage logging between these wind and fire disturbances. And you might think that that salvage logging would remove available niche space, niche space and so it would reduce regeneration post-fire, but they found the opposite effect. So areas that had salvage logging had more regeneration post-fire than areas that did not have the salvage, salvage logging but comparable blowdown intensities prior to that salvage logging. And so it's showing that that wind-fire relationship was driven by fuel loads, simply, and that logging removed those fuel loads, and that's why we saw that relationship. So many of these studies are conducted at relatively small spatial extents. The typical extent is at the stand scale. And one of the most common approaches to deriving forest state metrics to evaluate recovery after disturbance is to use ground-based field inventories of composition and structure. Again, usually at the stand scale. Um, these data, the advantage is that they're extremely accurate in terms of species ID and characteristics because those things are directly measured or they're directly observed. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that they are expensive in terms of time and resources, and that limits their spatial extent. So we're uniquely positioned in this moment to take advantage of rapidly increasing processing power and data availability to look at these questions across much larger regions. So this is a chrono sequence of fire, beetle kill, and drought paired with a satellite drive metric of forest state. Um, so that we could look at recovery following fire across the Southern Rockies ecoregion, which was that ecoregion I showed you a few slides ago. Um, the satellite drive metric of forest state is a product called Vegetation Continuous Fields, or VCF. You can download that online. It's available from 2000 to 2017 at a 250 meter resolution. And it shows you the percent pixel occupancy of three different, three different cover types. And this one is showing percent woody vegetation. So this graph is showing you forest state on the Y, or percent woody vegetation, over time since disturbance on the X. And we can see this pre-disturbance state indicated by this dotted horizontal line. We see a period of rapid mortality immediately following fire, followed by a period of lagged mortality, and finally recover recovery. So I found that if there's beetle kill um, prior to the fire, not only does that period of lagged mortality last longer, but recovery itself according to this metric, is delayed by about seven years. And drought further delays that recovery. So in terms of the mechanisms for this, which is a handful of the things that we'll be exploring next, <coughs> drought during or preceding fire, or beetle kill preceding fire, might increase fire severity. And that would increase tree mortality of adult trees, and also reduce any seed bank left in the soil for future recovery. Um, drought and beetle kill might also influence fire size, which would affect the probability of extra local seed influx for future recovery. And then also, um, drought following fire might affect seedling establishment through changing microsite conditions that might make those areas unsuitable for all species or differentially suitable for different species. So again, th those previous results showing forest state were derived from a data set that's relatively spatially coarse, 250 meter spatial resolution, and only available for a limited temporal window you know, from 2000 on. So what about using Landsat satellite data? How many people in here have used Landsat satellite data? So almost everyone, right? So you know, it's, it's much spatially finer relative to the VCF product, 30 meter resolution. The historical archive extends back to the early 80s. Um, However, even with this smaller resolution, the issue with classifying Landsat data and tracking land cover post-disturbance is that much of that change is happening at sub-pixel scales. So you can imagine um, a given pixel might be changing from 60 to 90% forest, for example, along its recovery trajectory, and it might be classified as forest under both of those conditions. But a 30% difference in forest cover has wide-reaching implications for everything from habitat quality, water filtration capacity, et cetera. 
I do want to note that there are a handful of people that are tracking um, more meaningful Landsat-derived metrics over time to model recovery after fire. I'm going to briefly mention uh, Melanie Vanderhoof um, at the USGS, who's been using a snow on and snow off NDVI to isolate evergreen forests and to track recovery, and that's been successful. But using classifications to track recovery has its limitations. So we're asking if and how the NEON AOP data can be used to examine resilience. Um, can it fit this missing piece of the puzzle? And um, I bet you know the answer. <laughs> this would be a really short talk if I just said no right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so one of the major considerations to answer that question is whether or not AOP has sufficient coverage of disturbance history to look at post-disturbance recovery. That's a, kind of a first step, right? And so of the 221 fires in the Southern Rockies in that MTBS data set, um, only one of those fires interacts with the NEON AOP. And you can see here, it kind of barely does. It's just on the corner of this AOP. There might be like a pixel or two in the AOP that's within that fire perimeter. And if you look up across the US, of the 23, almost 23,000 fires in that MTBS data set, I want to hear any guesses for how many you think intersect with AOP nationally. OK, those are much, it's 128. So not totally <laughs> unreasonable, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is a small fraction of all the available fires, right? Um, a couple caveats. This is just showing fire, so all, not all disturbances. And so NEON data might actually capture a history of other disturbance types a little bit more comprehensively. Another caveat is that this is only modern fire. This is 1984. Fire has been around for, for millennia, so 1984 is just a drop in the bucket. Um, so deeper fire history might actually be included. Um, we might not know about that deeper fire history in many of these sites. Um, and the, the final sort of most important caveat is this is, not, this is not a fault of NEON data. It was not, certainly not designed to capture disturbance history. Um, it was designed to cover environmental gradients. Um, but I like to show how we're using NEON AOP to capture post-fire recovery, even without a lot of that fire included within the AOP extents. Um, so Tristan mentioned yesterday that AOP was intended to cover areas large enough to overlap with satellite data to allow for scaling of that data, and that's the approach that we're taking. So in order to capture sub-pixel change across decades, we're integrating data that has complementary information embedded within it. And that includes um, ground-based field inventories, hyperspectral neon data, and multispectral drone-mounted data, and moderate resolution Landsat satellite data. So this integration will allow us to create forest state metrics that will pair with data on disturbance history to evaluate forest recovery post-disturbance. And the AOP really provides this missing link. The idea here is that we first extract the spectral signatures from the NEON AOP data at the location of each stem included in that NEON ground-based in-situ woody vegetation data. I want to briefly uh, mention the work of uh, grad student Victoria Scholl, who has been leading the charge on being able to do this. Um, so you have the locations of the NEON um, in situ woody vegetation data. I'm not sure if you can see, but each of these black dots represents a single stem in that ground-based data set. Um, <clears throat> so you could extract spectral signatures from those points, but you'd only be capturing a very small part of the canopy. That's sort of been touched on in various talks throughout the day. Um, the data set includes not only the location, but also the height and crown diameter of the trees. So you could also buffer the sample by the maximum crown diameter to capture more of the canopy. Um, but I imagine most of us have been in a forest before. Um, you know that trees are not perfectly circular. They overlap with one another. And so when you're on the ground, you can see that some crowns are obscured by neighboring crowns of trees that are taller. Um, and so in reality, if you were sampling at the buffered full diameter of these individual trees, in reality, you'd be capturing a lot of mixed pixels, spectrally mixed pixels, right? Um, so Victoria et al. have created this workflow um, just to extract species-specific spectral profiles in a way that considers the crown diameter and height of individual trees relative to their neighbors so that all or parts of trees that would be partially um, or totally you know, obscured by their neighbors aren't sampled when you're extracting those species-specific spectral profiles. Um, she's drafting this manuscript and plans to turn it into an R package. So look out for that R package. I think that'll be really useful. She's still um, drafting the catchy name. So if anyone has ideas, I'll pass it along to her.
Um, I also want to mention we have a field protocol to delineate crowns based on what we imagine would be visible from the aerial view. So if anyone's interested in chatting about that, I can chat about that with you also. Um, so once you've extracted the neon hyperspectral um, profiles from those individual trees, this is what they dropping things. This is what they look like. So each line here is an individual stem from the neon in situ data over the wavelengths that the AOP hyperspectral data covers. Um, again, I won't get into the weeds on the methodology today, but I want to mention that the intent is to build a spectral library that represents the Southern Rockies. And once that's completed, um, no promises on how long that'll take, that will be publicly available. Um, so then these spectral signatures are aggregated to the plant functional type. Um, because these signatures are just at the stems of the neon ground-based data, they are really only a small fraction of the total stems within the AOP, right? There are a lot of stems within the AOP that don't have ground data associated with them. Um, and so we want to include those signatures in that spectral library also, just to capture more of the spectral variability of individual species. And so um, we're segmenting uh, the pixels, uh, clustering them into individual crowns, and then classifying those crowns based on tree species or plant functional type. Um, so those spectral signatures will be included in the library also so that it's not limited to just the trees that have been surveyed with the ground data. But we also want to extend beyond the AOP. Um, of all species present in the Southern Rockies, we can imagine them that some of them might not be captured with the neon AOP. And if these missing species contribute significantly to the spectral variability of the plant functional type to which those species belong, we can imagine that even all the stems in the neon AOP might not be enough to capture the spectral variability of a given plant functional type. Um, so in addition, um, even for the species in the neon AOP flight path, there's some spectral variability associated with landscape features that might not be included within the flight path. For example, some aspects might not be included in the flight path. So what we're doing is collecting additional spectral signatures um, in areas outside of the AOP using UAS mounted uh, multispectral sensors. Um, and these sensors have filters that mimic the spectral characteristics of Landsat. So we're trying two different approaches. Um, Joseph McGlinchey has been spearheading integrating a kernel six camera array in with our drone. And we actually just purchased a MicaSense Red Edge dual camera array. So we're trying both of those platforms to get some additional spectral signatures. I wanted to show you these neon samples in spectral space, just to show you that they are differentiable in spectral space by plant functional type, which is exciting. So these clusters, um, plant functional type clusters, are then used as end members in spectral and mixing analysis. And in case that means nothing to you, um, the end result is a data layer um, for each year that designates the proportion of each Landsat pixel, a 30 meter pixel, that's occupied by a given plant functional type over the Landsat Historical Archive. So from 84 on, you have for every pixel um, percent dis deciduous forest, percent herbaceous, et cetera. Um, these are just some preliminary unmixing results just to show you just for a visualization of um, what this might look like. So this is generated using samples just from the neon ground-based in situ data, so a very small percent of all the samples that will eventually be included. Um, this is one raster, so each pixel in this Landsat data is designated as the proportional occupancy of a given plant functional type. And you'd have a raster layer for each plant functional type and for each year, ultimately. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, this is the AOP footprint. So this is just Landsat data um, around the AOP footprint. But this ultimately will be extended across the Southern Rockies, not just around the boundaries of the AOP footprint. I should put a scale bar on there. So this response variable is paired with data on disturbance history under a Bayesian modeling framework. Um, this modeling framework extends existing methods by including uh, temporal dependence and also flexibly modeled mixing proportions. And this Bayesian implementation facilitates propagation, um, error propagation from the mixing proportion to the parameters of interest. Um, so these are simulated results, just to note that. The X here is time since disturbance. And for simplicity, the Y here is um, one state variable, or again, the proportion of plant functional type in a given pixel. 
Um, for example, this you could imagine this as percent evergreen forest over time since disturbance. Um, in reality, we're modeling this in n dimensional space, and n would be the number of plant functional type groups that you're looking at. So instead of thinking about that pixel moving over 2D space, you could imagine it sort of bouncing around in n dimensional space. So we have some pixel that exists within some historical range of variation. And variation here is represented by the width of this line. Um, and in this simulation, a fire occurs. And there's some post-fire mortality. And then again, in one simulation, there was drought. And in one simulation, there was not drought. And so a state change is indicated in this drought simulation. And again, this is just a very simple example to show you the framework. Um, and it's, a state change is indicated because this recovery trajectory doesn't return to within the historical range of variation as the non-drought condition did. Um, so again, non-drought condition, forest recovers. Drought condition, there's a state change. Um, so this approach allows us to predict recovery under a variety of conditions. And this simulation was post-fire uh, and drought. The conditions could be ecological like that, but they could also be social. I mean, you could be looking at housing density, for example. And we're not there with this framework yet, but I'm really interested in collaborating with people who um, would like to think more critically about how we include social data in this framework. Um, you could even include management interventions in this framework. So how do management interventions at different times in the recovery trajectory affect that recovery trajectory? Um, I want to also mention the work of Trevor Coughlin, who's been looking at, um, in a slightly different context, not using the AOP, but how recovery trajectories uh, can be used to tease out what's happening uh, with vital rates of species. And so that type of approach could give some additional information here as well. Um, this kind of approach al allows us to also um, add some additional components to what we might consider an extreme disturbance event. So disturbance extremes are often characterized by their characteristics, right? A large fire, an intense fire, um, having really nothing to do with the ecological or social outcomes of that event. Um, and not to say that people aren't talking about extreme disturbances in a social ecological context. They absolutely are. I mean, hundreds of them. But this framework allows us to characterize extreme disturbances by the ecosystem response. So for example, we might see that several low intensity disturbances in succession result in altered stable states, just for example. So in conclusion, you know, fire uh, is fundamentally a biophysical process. The drivers of fire, fuel, meteorological conditions, and um, ignitions are all affected by people. So we have the social and ecological system in, in fire, which is why I think it's so interesting. We know that fire characteristics are changing national, nationally, in part because people are putting pressure on all three of those drivers or those controls of fire. Um, fire impacts resilience, you know, both single events and in combination with other ecological perturbations, um, fire is affecting our social ecological resilience. And we are uniquely positioned right now because of increasing processing power, increasing data availability, uh, to scale up theory that's been based on studies with much smaller spatial extents to larger landscapes. The NEON AOP doesn't capture much modern fire history. Uh, can it be used to evaluate post-fire recovery and resilience anyway? And so again, we say yes. Um, we present one of probably many frameworks for doing this. Um, we're using data integration again, which allows us to extend the extent of the NEON, NEON AOP both spatially and historically through the Landsat Historical Archive um, to create these ecosystem state metrics. Um, these state metrics, again, they capture subpixel change in plant functional type. And they take advantage of that fine uh, spatial resolution and that rich spectral information that is embedded within the NEON AOP to dovetail with the historical archive and the spatial extent of Landsat. So we can evaluate the impacts of single disturbances and multiple interacting disturbances on resilience. Um, in this example, I was showing you vegetation composition changes. But that can be extended to other metrics of social or ecological resilience when combined with additional data or known information. And again, I'd love to speak with anyone about some ways forward for doing that. Um, one example would be if we can have percent plant functional type occupancy across a watershed, this might contribute to modeling of water quality and associated ecosystem services, just as a sort of off the cuff example. Um, we also can add to our definition of extremes. Again, thinking about what disturbance uh, characteristics and combinations of disturbances actually uh, 
are considered extreme in terms of their ecological or social impacts and how they um, create deviations from historical uh, c conditions. Um, we can also use this framework to directly evaluate the efficacy of management strategies and to look at spatial patterns of stability and resilience across the landscape. So this work's benefited from the support of many um, colleagues and collaborators and funders. I just wanted to list a few here. Um, and thank you for taking the time to listen. And I'm, I'm enjoying more conversation with you all. Yep. <laughs>